Hi writers, Laura Purdy Salas here, and I'm going to give you just a quick tour of how I go through the PW Children's Bookshelf newsletter and add stuff to my publisher's database. So first of all, my email doesn't display images, um, so I always click on this in my email right here, this view it in your browser. So now I'm looking at the newsletter online. Um, so yours might look slightly different in your email. This is the PW Children's Bookshelf from June 14th, 2018. That's a couple weeks ago. This newsletter comes out uh, sometimes twice a week, sometimes once a week. And I often find myself replying to urgent emails, so I set this aside, and so sometimes I'll have, you know, two or three weeks worth and I go through them all at once, which is okay. It makes it um, more efficient for me, I think. So as I go down through the children's bookshelf, there are interesting articles from Publishers Weekly that relate to the kid lit world, the world of children's and young adult literature. So often I will click on these and these will take me to the articles that they are highlighting in this newsletter. And there's all sorts of interesting stuff for getting more familiar with uh, children's literature as a whole and how the publishing industry works, what the trends are and things like that. So. If you have time, I definitely recommend reading the articles um, that they highlight here. However, if you don't have time, don't feel guilty. You know, the idea is to get into the newsletter and take out what you are most looking for. And so often when I sit down to go through these newsletters, what I'm looking for is market information. I'm looking for any new publishers or editors that I think might be a good fit for me. And I'm looking for news of acquisitions or purchases that editors have made that make me think, oh, that's kind of, that's a little bit like my manuscript, you know, XYZ. Maybe they would be a good market for that. Okay, so in this right hand sidebar, each newsletter has a people. Uh, column here. And that's where they talk about new hires and promotions and transfers and things like that. So when I look through these, I do not look at um, marketing and publicity names. I, I can't even remember editors' names. So while those people are very important, and when I'm actually publishing a book with a publisher, I get to know those names of the people that I work with but for submitting those names don't matter. So I come down to this second one and I see Danny Valladares, Valladares? Ooh, I'm probably murdering that name, um, has joined Random House Books for Young Readers as editor for the Rodeo Kids imprint. Now, for some reason, I think of Rodeo as like how-to nonfiction books, but I might be totally wrong. I didn't know it was an imprint. Um, so I'm going to just do a quick search here and see what I can find about that publisher. Okay, yeah, so it does, it's a healthy, happy living company, and that's what I think of it as. I know I've seen like gardening books and um, family activity and working out kind of books. So I did not realize this article is from uh, probably a year or so ago. So now I see that Rodale Kids is an imprint of Random House, which I did not know. So if I were writing things that I thought might relate to that, then what I would do is I would go over here, and this is my publisher's database, and I would type in Rodale to see if I have anything else in there. I have the name of an editor who was formerly with Rodale and moved to Ferristras Chiro. 
Uh, let's see. Okay, Penguin Random House. Oh, Rodale. So I have the name of one person already there and something that she bought. And so I think chances are kind of unlikely that I'm going to have stuff to submit there. Um, it's not quite my wheelhouse. And since I already have one editor's name, I don't think I'm going to worry about adding this second editor there. I will say the exception to that would be, uh, or two exceptions would be number one, if I had a lot of manuscripts and I thought this was a really strong fit for my work in general, then I would probably want all the editor names I could gather. <laughs> And another exception would be if I had a listing that this editor had acquired something very close to something I've written, then I would probably include her. But since neither of those is true, and since I already have one Rodale Kids editor's name, I'm just going to leave it at that and not add anything. So coming down here to Macmillan Children's Publishing, uh, I see they have a new associate designer. And um, so I'm not going to worry about that. And then I see FSG, so Ferrer Strauss Giraud, has a new editorial assistant, Elizabeth Lee. So I'm going to come back over here and I'm going to go to let me see. I'm going to sort that. Oh dear, I'm really bad at keeping track of the imprints. Um, my idea was that this is um, the publisher here in A and the imprint, um, which is a sub part of the publisher here in B. Um, but I don't have Ferris Strauss Giro there. Instead, I have all my Ferris Strauss Giro entries here in my publisher list. Um, so I see I have I have four editors names there and several of those are recent names. Um, so I know I've got some updated names. If I look back here, I see Elizabeth Lee, um, okay, and I already have her in here. So I'm doing fine on that one. I don't need that. This next entry is a marketing designer. Don't need that. Now here's um, an assistant editor at Razorbill. And I, I know that Razorbill is a young adult imprint. At least, I'm pretty sure Razorbill is a young adult imprint. I'm just going to go check. But uh, so if I wrote young adult, I would be interested in having that information. But because I am not interested in writing young adult, sorry that I keep kind of pausing, um, but this is live. This is how I really do this. So. Um, that's just, it's kind of a stop and start process. And I see uh, right in the little overview that I could see even on Google before I actually clicked all the way through, it's middle grade and it's young adult. And so that's kind of what I thought. So Razorbill is not an imprint that I'm interested in since I don't write for those age ranges. So again, I'm not going to worry about adding that person. So once I've looked through everybody on the people, that's my first main interest. Now, as I go down here, I see plenty of other articles, continue interviews, all sorts of things that are really great reads usually. So again, if you have the time, that is awesome to read these uh, different articles. If you're in a rush, however, um, as I usually am, then I head down to the second crucial part of this newsletter, which is the rights report. So the rights report is a listing of sales of kid lit books, children's and young adult books. Because I'm really 
interested primarily in picture books and a little bit in easy readers, I tend to skip down to the picture book section. Sadly, they are not labeled, but usually when you start seeing two pictures, that's when I know that that's a picture book because they've got a picture of the author who sold the text and the illustrator who is doing the art. And so then I kind of work my way up and I see um, where the picture books kind of start. So I read through the picture book listings and here's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for picture books that have sold that feel akin to my kind of book. So for me personally, I like poetry and lyrical picture books about nature. I also like really funny fiction picture books. And I'm also very interested in nonfiction, and I write a lot, lot of nonfiction. Um, and so those are kind of the areas I tend to look for. And I just check out each description. So it tells me the title, Pugtato, a picture book focusing on friendship and self-acceptance that features Pugtato and other foodables friends, such as Birdana and Cucumber and Thingamole's friends, such as Municorn and Cactopus. Okay, so, um, so if that hit the kind of thing I like to write, then what I would do is head over to my publisher's database, and I might add a note about this. And so actually, I do think that sounds really fun. I don't know that I have Zonder Kids in here at all, so I'm going to come down here to my Z's, and I do not. I'm going to do a search just to make sure I don't have it as a... Okay. As a comment anywhere. So I'm going to add an entry here. So Zonder Kids, and I think... Okay, it's Zonder Kids with a Z at the end. And I want to say... Is Zonder Kids a Christian publisher? Let's see. Yes, it is a Christian publisher. Okay, so y'all, I have been writing books for kids for a long time. And as you can tell, I do not know right off the bat what every publisher publishes. So don't feel bad that it's going to take you a while to learn these things too. Um, so, Barbara Herndon is the person who has acquired this. So, I'm going to come in here, and I don't know her title, which is what my E column is. Um, I got this information from a June 2018 Publishers Weekly. I use PW to mean PW Children's Bookshelf for me. And then I come back over here and I'm going to copy and paste the description of this picture book. And I just paste it right in here. And I know that that means she acquired that book. Okay. Now let's say in six months I come back and find it mentions another book that she has acquired. I don't do a whole new line for her. I want to keep each editor with just one area where everything I know about that editor is there. So instead, I would do something like this. Um, let's say it's in January 2019 in the PW Children's Bookshelf. I read that she acquired another book that sounds interesting. I would add it like this in here, okay? So, I have added her. Um, all right, next I'm going down to this one. Uh, Liz Zabla and Anna Roberto at Fywell and Friends have bought Hidden Homes. Uh, this picture book reimagines the habitats of various animals based on the human habitat of the same name. Well, that sounds really cool. Um, and so, now, I have sent manuscripts to Fiewell and Friends before and been rejected. They're a small 
um, kind of elite publishing imprint. And um, I'm interested in getting in with them someday. And so I like this information because I've been trying to learn more about what is a Fiewell and Friends book, you know, what distinguishes it. And so I'm going to go to my list here, my database, and I'm going to look up Fiewell and Friends. Here's my entry for Liz Sabla. So here I have some old titles. Now I'm going to add June 2018. And I am going to, let's see, copy and paste this. All right, so I go down and I continue doing that same thing throughout this list of acquisitions. And a few things to keep in mind. First of all, if I want to know more about an editor, one thing about these acquisitions that are listed here in PW Children's Bookshelf is that usually they announce it about a year before the book comes out. In reality, the acquisition pub uh, picture books take a long time, so that acquisition might really have happened two or three years ago. So it's not a guarantee that that editor is still at that publisher. Um, so when I get later in the process where I'm actually getting ready to submit something, I'm always double checking things like that. Um, so the other thing that means though is that I can't go check out this book at the library and read it to really understand what the sensibility of the book is. Later on, once you've had your database for a couple of years, you will find that, oh, as you look at the names, your editor's names in your database, you'll be able to look at their list of titles and some of them will then finally have been published. But when you first put them in, you know, the, all you've got is the title and the description. So this database becomes more and more useful the longer you keep it. I used to have an enormous database going back many, many years covering every publisher I came across. And it was so big and unwieldy. And a couple of years ago, I scrapped it. And I just started keeping this one, a much more focused one, um, last year in 2017. So I would go down, finish up anything from there. Uh, down at the bottom, they always have featured reviews. So again, those might be things you want to check out. And once a week, they end up with Tales from the Slush Pile, a little uh, comic strip about being a writer. So that is what the PW Children's Bookshelf looks like. This is what my publisher database looks like. And I'm going to give you more information on how to use that database in your submissions process, or at least how I use my database in my submissions process as this series goes on. But for right now, I just wanted to give you an idea of where most of the stuff in my publisher's database comes from. I will also say I use other sources, of course, SCBWI, which is a wonderful organization for children's writers, uh, their bulletin, often has information I use um, at conferences, um, looking at publishers catalogs, a friend might give me a name. So there are many different sources of information that you can put into your database. I, you know, I would say probably 80% of my information is from the children's bookshelf newsletter. So that's why I was focusing on this today. But always what I'm looking for is the publisher name, the imprint name, the name of the editor, the editor's title, if, if it is listed, um, the, an email address if I have one, the source of where the information came from, and then the information that I, you know, that I took from it, what book did they acquire or whatever. 
every once in a while I will highlight something in yellow in my database just as a reminder that when I look at it that I think um, either there's a book I really want to look at so it's a reminder a reminder for me to look for it when it comes out or maybe it's an editor or a publisher that I specifically think might be a good fit for a picture book that I have in the works or ready to submit. And what I also do is if I get a rejection or an email from an editor that just says, sorry, we don't look at unsolicited manuscripts, um, then I cross them out on here by highlighting them in a dark color. That way I don't accidentally enter them again and resubmit to them and really tick them off. So I do that sometimes too. Okay, I think that's it. I hope that that was helpful. Happy writing and happy databasing.